Lord, thanks so much for a special time to honor you and to just hear what you've done in and through Mike's life. Just overwhelming to me and personally, uh, such a privilege to walk through this life with this man. So I pray, as always, you be honored, people would be blessed, you be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Mike O'Connell Jr. Come on. Let's go. Let's go. I've been waiting for this, man. This is great. This is so stinking cool. Yeah. I I wanted to actually kick us off. And I know I say this probably all the time, but I wanted to say thanks so much. You're one of my best friends. Mm -hmm. Um, When you start a church by faith, you leave Fort Lauderdale, you have no idea what's going to happen. And look at us here. We're in the auditorium almost three years it's been since God built this through the virus, <laughs> through the, the pandemic. Mm. And you never know who God's going to send to co-labor with you. And here, over 10 years, you've been with us. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of my most trusted advisors. Um, like I said, best friends. Your kids are like my grandkids. For real. And I'm just honored, man, to, to do this life with you and Jay and the kids. And today, special episode. And, you know, everybody listening in, we started this story podcast for two reasons, to honor God with what he's done through our lives and to help people. And there's a lot of people that will identify with some particular parts of your story. Mm-hmm. And so I wanted to start there, Mike, just uh, maybe bring us back. I mean, w- when you first started growing up, you grew up in Iowa City, which is interesting as a cyclone right. growing up in Iowa mm-hmm. City. But I wanted to just maybe give an idea to the listener how you grew up maybe a couple couple pivotal points of your journey. Absolutely. So, yeah, so born and raised in Iowa and, uh, you know, grew up a Hawkeye fan. But um, That's anyways, crazy. Yeah, so wild. Um, my parents, you know, my father's name is Michael. That's why I'm Michael Jr. And uh, my mother's name is Deborah. And they had me at a very young age. So my mother was 21 years old. Mm. My dad was 26 years old. And uh, so, so I come out and then 14 months later, uh, they have my younger brother, Zach. And, um, and so, you know, we're living life. And then, you know, life, life uh, definitely, um, you know, at, at a young age sort of took a turn, I guess, that, that we didn't really expect. But I, I count it as a memory from my childhood that was, um, that sort of changed my trajectory forever. But at two years old, uh, my parents uh, decided to get a divorce. Mm. What's interesting is you know, now raising children and just thinking about the development of a two-year-old, it's kind of interesting because when I think back on that season of my journey of my life, I can actually remember the moment that they sat us down to share that that was- That blows me away. You know, what was gonna happen. I'll never forget it was a mustard yellow sort of velvet uh, couch and they sat us down and they shared that news with us. And what's so interesting is one of the things in my childhood that I'm very grateful for. I mean, there were definitely some ups and downs through that particular transition and season, but by and large, my parents uh, worked really well together to create a good childhood for my brother and I, but it was very different. You know, I remember uh, just even like having a house that was empty, like all of a sudden furniture was gone. And next thing you know, you're going to dad's midweek and then, you know, you're switching weekends and you're kind of moving around. And you have to remember that this was such an interesting time in our life because, like I said, my mother was very young. And so here's my mom at 23 years old with two kids. And that was sort of a crossroads moment for her that really changed how we were brought up. She went back to school full time, started working full time. And um, and so it was, it was just such a such an interesting time being a kid. My grandparents played a really major role in raising us as young kids. And, uh, but as, as a child, man, we, we uh, you know, my brother and I being 14 months apart, you just give us a ball and we were good to go. Man. <laughs> like, I was, I was going to say, I mean, to this day, you're the most athletic guy on our staff. You know, I hate playing basketball against you because you just back me down and, and then you, you, you not only can just back me down, but then you can just take me to the rack with that dope crossover. Nice J. <laughs> Uh, I love you and hate you when we play basketball. <laughs> I'm messing with you. Yeah. But that was really such a huge part of your life growing up. And you talk about it quite a bit. 
very similar in my upbringing where come from divorced families, both, God bless both of our parents, by the way, they, yeah. the way they handled that and loved each other through that, I think that was really big for our development, but both of us kind of had our identity in sports really. hundred percent. So can you may, maybe take us, you know, through that and you even had a pivotal point in high school where you had kind of that, that near death experience. Maybe yeah. talk a little bit about that as well. Yeah, so I mean, athletics are, have, have been a big part of my life. I would say are still a big part of my life, but very, very different perspective now yeah. at 36 years old. So to take, to go all the way back, I think anytime you walk through a season like that, um, as, as great of a job as my parents did, there was still a gap in God's design, great, you know? Great and so there's no question that uh, growing up, there was a bit of an identity crisis, you know? Kind of asking the question, like, who am I? And, you know, even even the challenge it must have been for my parents to parent through that situation. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, you know, it's not easy. You're having to coordinate a lot and right. all the transferring. And so I think for me, there were moments where I just, I was confused on where to go to feel that deep love and acceptance right. and affirmation. Well, I started playing sports, soccer first, and then it was flag football and then basketball. And before you know it, I was playing tackle football in third grade and just had a ton of success as an athlete. Like, I, I wish mean, I could go back there and watch <laughs> you, you just absolutely dominate. The, the, even the soccer field, man, that'd be Seriously. so fun. I remember, I mean, soccer, I, I, I remember it very, very, uh, like it was yesterday, like hmm. in that early season, I, there would be Saturdays where I would score like six or seven goals yep. in a game. And affirmation, Yeah, and so you're getting, you're getting like, the pat on the back. And I just remember, I think at a subconscious level, sort of making a vow in that moment that man, this feels good. Wow. Like this is what it's all about. And so I think that set me on a trajectory. Let's call it from the time I was five years old until I finished, you know, professional sports where I was, I was chasing that thing. Mm. It, it was really like now looking back, it was like being on a rat wheel, just looking for identity in my performance and who I could be as an athlete. And let's be honest, when you are a successful athlete, there's a lot of notoriety that comes with right. it. There's a lot of pats on the back. And that that is really where I derived my identity as a young man. And then you, so take that fast forward to in high school, yep. bring us to that injury because I, I feel like that was a pivotal moment. Yeah, I think God was really, when I look back, I think he was trying to get my attention even um, through that situation. I was a junior in high school and up to this point, you know, I, went to a smaller school in the state of Iowa. And so, you know, played varsity baseball as an eighth grader, was on varsity basketball and football as Crazy. a freshman. So here we are, it's my junior year. I had had a ton of success, you know, was being recruited by all the major division one schools for basketball and football. And we're playing in the state semifinals of the first time that we had made the playoffs in 31 years. Oh my I mean, this goodness. Was, this was just kind of the moment, right? And um, we're in a really tight game and uh, it's the start of the second half, they go down and score, and I go to block the PAT coming off the edge. That's right. And a guy from our team came from the opposite side. So we're both like Superman. I oh. go like high, he goes low, and his oh. helmet hits me in the stomach. Now, friendly fire. Friendly fire, and it was crazy because to this day, I've never experienced, and I can hardly even put words to what I felt in that moment. It was crazy. And my coach, you know, and trainers come running out and they're looking at me and they describe it as I look pale white and I'm kind of rolling around. Well, they get me off the field to the sideline uh, and they're looking me over for like maybe five or 10 minutes. And they're like, something just isn't right here. Like something's off. And so they cart me off to over where the ambulances are and they determine not to take me in an ambulance, but then they, they take me in my parents' car to the local hospital. Well, the interesting thing was is we were playing uh, at Northern Iowa, and I'm from Iowa City, so about an hour and a half away from where I'm from. So they take me to this hospital, they do these CT scans, they're running tests on me. The doctors come back and they're like, man, the diagnosis is you lacerated your liver, and we're gonna need to do an operation on you. Well, my mom, you know, being from Iowa City, it's where the University of Iowa hospitals are, in her mind, she's thinking, if we can get him transported back there, that would just, it would be the best. It, I think part of it was just she trusted those doctors sure. a little bit more. 
So she asked if I was stable enough and they said yes. So they transferred me to the University of Iowa Hospital and Clinics. I get there and their staff is reviewing the CT scans and they come to us and they're like, you don't have a lacerated liver. You must have just bruised your abdomen pretty bad. Well, when they were transporting me, they overdosed me on morphine. So I'm coming in and out of consciousness. So they tell my mom, they say, hey, when he kind of comes back to it, we'll be able to release him later this evening. And uh, through the wisdom of, a, of another woman to my mom, which really, I think it's just the grace of God. When Total I back grace on of God. It, she says, no way, don't, don't let them send him home. So they, they keep me overnight. I wake up in the middle of the night and I'm in excruciating pain. They're like, something's not right here. They go do another CT scan. They realize that I had a perforated bowel, oh, geez. which is a hole in the small intestine. And because we were playing in the state semifinals, this injury happened at like 1030 in the morning on a Friday. So it's Saturday morning. We're talking like 17 hours after the injury. So you have to imagine all that those toxins are getting into oh, my, my system. Oh my goodness. So it was, I just noticed like, cause I w even at that age, I was pretty aware. And I just remember looking at my mom, looking at the doctors and I was like, something isn't right here. And uh, I, I, there was a, there's a moment that really sticks out to me. They're, they're carting me down the hallway to the operating room. My mom's there and we get to the double doors where she can no longer come. And I hear her drop to her knees and start like wailing. Oh my goodness. You know, in her mind, she tells the story that she knew because she had a medical background. She's like, I don't know if I'm gonna see my son again. Oh my goodness. So they, they take me in and um, do emergency surgery, take a lot of my organs out, you know, patch up the whole. The interesting thing is, is the surgeon that did the operation, he said, man, you were starting to go septic. <laughs> so I look back on that and it's like, it was such an interesting perspective shift for me. 24 hours earlier, I'm playing at an all state level. I'm running around on the football field, doing what I love to do. The next day, I can't even walk from a hospital bed to the, to the door 10 feet away. I mean, it was a life changing moment like for me. Like that, boom. Unbelievable. And you think about losing weight, you know, some of the, some of the coaches that were recruiting you yep. kind of back away a little bit. Yep. Fast forward, you know, you're wanting to walk on to Iowa, if I remember yep. right. Yep. You go in and I forget the, the lady looks at you and was like, hey, you're not in the top whatever of your school, so denied. Yep. And you think about, you know, a feeling of rejection as a young kid and then injury and then feeling rejected. By God's grace, a door opens to walk on at Iowa State. Like, imagine you're going to the, the enemy camp, Coach Mack, right? That whole story is pretty cool. You get that opportunity, you show up to Iowa State, and I tell, tell us a little bit about that, because to me, I'm just thinking about the listener right now that goes, I'm, I'm in over my head or I've been rejected or, you know, no one has affirmed me. Um, it, the, 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 it's stacked against me, the deck's stacked against me, but I really believe God's continuing to move in my life and I want to continue to move forward. To me, I think this is an interesting part part of the journey. Yeah, and so there, I end up at Iowa State in 2006 through crazy circumstances. So cool. Would have never dreamed of going to that university. I mean, I I grew up going to Iowa Hawkeye games, man. Like that was <laughs> that was my squad. And so um, here I am. I show up. Uh, it's 2006. Um, I'm a walk on. And here's the interesting thing is I, I'm not even invited to training camp that first year. I show up on the first day of classes. Unbelievable. So what I tell people is I show up on that first day and I'm back, you know, getting my gear. They hand me my gear. It says like 146 on my gear. <laughs> and I'm thinking, well, <laughs> I'm an athlete and 146 is not a good sign. <laughs> <laughs> Because you've always been number one. Number one. Let's dude. be honest. Your whole life. Whole life. You're you're number one here. You're the best athlete on our team. You've been number one. All of a sudden, you're one four six. One four six, man. And so I got. <laughs> I've got this like, this this like all this gear in my hands, and I start walking down the down the hallway towards the locker room, and I I hear the guy kind of step his. You know, it was our training uh, training room guy, and he's like, hey, hey, OC, you're not in the main locker room. You're in the visitors locker room across the hall. So here I am, dude. I've got this gear 146. Oh my I march across the training room, probably waved at Mark Coberly and those guys mm -hmm. and and I get into this locker room. It legit looked like it was a locker room from the 1970s. 
probably the worst visitors locker room in the Big 12. Orange carpet, <laughs> orange metal lockers. And the reality is, is it wasn't just me. It was like 20 other scrubs in there. <laughs> One guy had like, like the Rex know, Max. The Rex Max. Yeah, and, baby. And uh, I'm just like, what is going on here? Oh, you know? Man. And they didn't, it was so funny because we go out to practice and they don't tell us anything, man. Like we're just out there. They don't tell us how to line up. There's like no instructions. So we get out there and already you just feel like you don't belong. You're like, I do not belong here. And then, you know, on top of that, on game days, no name on the back of our jerseys. It's like, who's no name 46? On Wednesdays, my two roommates, who were the top two recruits in our class, they would, like, go train with all the freshman red shirts, and I, like, got to sleep in because they didn't want me to come work out. And when I did get to work no out... That's a title of message. Yeah. No name. No name. When I did work out, they would put me in the corner, uh, Getty would, with a stick, and, uh, and they'd have me do, like, squats with a stick and push-ups. And, I mean, it was... You want to talk about starting at the bottom. I mean, you want to... Wow. Looking back, it totally, God was just, he man, He was putting me through the refiner's fire. Character development. Yeah, before I even had really a, 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 a relationship with God, because at this point in my journey, I was aware of God, um, you know, taught about God, but definitely not surrendered or following God. Sure. And so, but God was doing something in me, even at that you, stage of my journey. You think about, I think about the sovereignty of God and how he develops a man, develops a woman. And to me, when I look at you, I say it all the time, the two words I always think of when I think of Mike O'Connell, humble command. And that's a really, really tricky tension because as a stage communicator, as a leader, which you're a phenomenal leader, but I think one of the best things about you, why people love to follow you, Mike, is because your humility. But think about when if if you're always winning and you're always the guy, I think it's harder and harder to be humble. But now God in his sovereignty bringing you through some circumstances that have that that through the process form you and you never forget where you came from and all the success that God's, you know, had through your life to this point, you know, you've been able to really stay humble, but you also are a great leader who knows how to coach. You know how to command the stage, command an audience. And it's not in a weird, prideful, like in my way or the highway. Mm -hmm. And I, it's interesting to see this story develop, you know? Second, the, the other thing I wanted to hit during your college years was Curtis Taylor, yeah. uh, Hollywood video parking lot, but even the friend that at practice invited you to do a Bible study. I think it's maybe your sophomore or junior year. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Because to me, when we talk about, you know, these story podcasts, I want to really hit that surrender moment. Like, all right, I'm all in with God. Absolutely. I tell people this now. I went to school to play, to play football at Iowa State, and God brought me to Iowa State so that I could begin a relationship with him. And I'll never forget it. It's, you know, what I just described. I'm walking through my freshman season, and if I'm just really honest, this is by far the darkest time in my life, which you would think, man, you're playing division one football. You're, you know, you're doing what your dream was from the time you're a little kid. But, uh, man, uh, was in a relationship for four years that ended, you know, things were just really tough and difficult at Iowa state. And one day this guy named David Ray came up to me. I'll yeah, never that's forget right. it. David, David Ray, Ray yeah. man, comes up, taps me on the shoulder, says, Hey man, um, would love for you to come with me to this Bible study. And, you know, because I had been exposed to God, it, I was open to it. So I was like, hey, I'll, I'll join you. And I get invited to Doc Greenwald's house. He was the orthopedic surgeon, which I'm sure we'll talk about him a little yeah. bit later. But man, walk into his house. And I just had never seen a, a biblical picture like this before. I come into this house. I'm invited warmly by his wife, by Doc. His kids are running around, they're having fun, they're engaging as a family. She made the most bomb dessert I've ever heard. And then Doc just sits up against his little fireplace, cracks open the word, we start going through it, and he's kind of breaking it down. I'm thinking, isn't this guy a doctor? Like, what's going on here? Like, can life, <laughs> can life be lived this way? Yeah. So that happens, and I meet Curtis Taylor at that Bible study. Curtis happened to be about three years older than me. Well, fast forward um, about a year later. So for a year, I'm going to that wow. Bible study, I'm showing up, 
I'm leaving, living like hell. Yeah. Just life is falling apart. Mm. You know, doing everything that you can imagine a college freshman would do. And, um, but I kept showing up. I wow. kept showing, something was drawing me to Wednesdays. Well, you fast forward a fall later, and now I've been going to Bible study for a year and just learning more about about who God is. And, and one night, Curtis and I pulled up to Hollywood Video Parking Lot, and we were going to go in and rent a movie. We we're just kind of hanging out or whatever. And for whatever reason, uh, the conversation just shifted in the car. Next thing you know, he's sharing the gospel, and it just resonates so much with my heart that my real need was forgiveness. Man. It was forgiveness, repentance, and then... It, 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 you know, for me, in my mind, uh, faith was connected to this performance and this works thing. Yeah. What I realized in that moment is that I could never earn God's love. I could never work for God's love. Yeah. He loved me so much that he died the death that I deserved and now made a way for me to be restored into right relationship with him. And it, it, it truly resonated in my heart in that moment, 2007 Hollywood video parking lot. And my life has never been the same. It's so crazy to think too, how about the power of the invite by David Ray and then the boldness and the courage of KT to be in that car led by the spirit to invite you to say yes and to surrender your life to Christ. And it happens there. It's so cool. And I even think about Doc Greenwald and Allison and how they always provided a home that was non judgmental. Mm -hmm. It was warm. They modeled what it is to be a biblical Christian, and then they trusted God in his sovereign timing f to deal with the individual. Absolutely. That to me, I think is so profound, right? So you come to Christ and, you know, you, I, I got to learn though, I, gotta, I want the listener and I want to record this because remember now, you're, you're coming in as a walk-on, kind of overlooked, went through some injury, top recruit all of a sudden, kind of the bottom of the barrel, you worked your way through some things. And if I remember right, you kind of had a spring that was kind of wasn't the best. Your coach is really honest with you. Mm -hmm. And now you have a choice. It's like, do I bounce and go play at a different place? Do I stay? Especially nowadays in the NIL deals and the transfer portal. I feel like a lot of guys are tapping too early. They were hitting the eject button mm -hmm. where God wants to grow them in character. And you were kind of in this place if I remember right, KT said, hey man, like, no, I'll stick with it. And then you roll into, I think it was maybe your junior year. And then all of a sudden, God starts opening up a door. Can you can yeah, yeah, maybe absolutely. talk about that? So you're exactly right. I mean, you know, so it's what's interesting about my college career is I came in under uh, Dan McCartney and then, you know, he, he gets fired that first season. Well, Gene Chizik comes in. And I end up lettering for two years, you know, that second year. So my sophomore season, uh, I'm in the two deep at safety. So I'm getting like 10 to 15 snaps a game on defense, playing on all special teams, having a pretty good year heading into my junior year. And uh, his staff was starting to talk about putting me on scholarship. Well, then he takes a job and bounces to Auburn. Right. Yeah. So here I am. And it's like, you know, for me, mm my spirit was just like crushed in that moment. Cause I'm like, man, I'm going to have to prove myself to a third staff. Wow. And uh, Paul Rhodes comes in. I'll never forget it. First meeting says, Hey, we're aware of what you've done here. Just come out and basically prove that that's who you are during spring. And we're going to take care of you. That's so cool. So I come out in spring ball and it, for whatever reason, man, just absolutely lay an egg, just making mistakes that were, that were mistakes I usually didn't make. And uh, yeah, you're exactly right. Coach sits me down and says, hey man, you're, we're moving you to third on the depth chart and you'll probably play special teams this fall, but not much defense. And when I heard wow, that, man, which looking back, I'm so thankful for his honesty. I'm so mm. thankful that, that I had a coach that just looked me in the eyes and told me where I stood. Right. But I didn't like it. Yeah. It's not what I wanted. And so I was ready to go, man. I was ready to run. I called my dad, I said, dad, I just want to play. I love this game too much. I'm, I'm done with the politics. I was frustrated. I was making excuses. I wasn't taking ownership. I just thought it would be easier to go to Northwest Missouri State, finish my career. He's like, hey, we support you. KT rolls over, says, no, nah, man, God is not done right in your story. Come Look on. how far you've come. Golly, dude. He's not done with you yet. And it's like, it didn't even take long, but, but that snapped me right back to the wow. mindset that I had when I came to Iowa State. Wow. 
Well, fast forward four months later, we're in fall training camp and I win the starting job, get put on scholarship, you know, go on to have a, a great junior season. We go win a bowl game and became a team captain my senior year and finished my career strong at Iowa State. So, man, I, I almost missed out on my breakthrough, but God used KT in that moment to, you know, <laughs> you know, speak some truth that's, in me. That's so wild. And I think about from my perspective, right? Because after your senior year, Doc Greenwald, yep. I get a I get a text from him, hey, you know, I need someone to come over to Mexico to to invest in some of my my graduating seniors. I'm going to have them over to my place in in Puerto Vallarta. And I'm like, let me pray about this. Yes, when do I show up? And I'll never forget. We go to there. I meet you for the first time. We connect. And I could just see your zeal for God. And the bromance began way back then. And just to think, man, like, even just that, we would have missed out on that connection. And then, you know, you're, you're, training for the NFL. I think it was the lockout season mm -hmm. and interesting, went down to Miami, had a workout, didn't quite work out, all that kind of stuff. And then I remember getting an email from you mm -hmm. and you said, Hey, PT, can you just pray for me, man? Like I'm really struggling. I'm trying to get, you know, get to the NFL. And, and I remember emailing you back, Matthew 6, 33, I'll never forget it. And it really was a word I felt from the Lord. Seek first the kingdom of God everything else is going to be added to you. And that day you emailed me back. <laughs> you can't make this stuff up. And you said, you're never going to believe this, but the UFL has a franchise in Omaha, Nebraska, where you're at PT. And my agent just called. They want to fly me in that day, that day, that it just was that day. Blows so my literally mind. the next day I'm in Omaha <laughs> and I'm, you know, I'm at there. They had started training camp. So I come in and I'm just just thrusted into training camp and I got to go win a job. There's no guarantees. Oh, no. And uh, it's crazy to think that of all places in America, uh, about four months after we met, here I am in Omaha, Nebraska, fall 2011, playing in the UFL for the Omaha Nighthawks. And that was really the beginning of, I feel like, what God's been orchestrating all the way back in 2006 when the University of Iowa didn't let me into school. It's like, there's no way I'm sitting in this chair today mm. if that moment doesn't happen in my life. Think about it, yeah, a closed door, open door, and God's sovereign hand on your life throughout that entire process. You come here, you know, you were part of the church for a while. You went out to LA to train, out in LA. Pastor Frank and I are at a Calvary Chapel conference. Never forget it, at Harvest OC, Levi Lusco is teaching. Afterwards, I'm hanging out with you and KT, Pastor Frank. He looks at you, he said, hey, I don't know what you're doing, but if you really like what's happening in Omaha, he's like, I challenge you, man, go, you know, go back there, start studying, start serving and see what God might want to do. You, you, by faith, pack up, you didn't have a job, you come here. Somehow God opens up a door, a medical device team here in Omaha. You, I remember you take over, I think one of our young adults was leaving for um, a discipleship school, you, you plug right in, you take over our setup team. That's when we were a mobile mm -hmm. church and faithfully every single day, every single weekend, you're building a team. You're leading with that same character that I always love about you. Humble command. People want to follow you. That team builds, you know, you're leading other groups. And I just see this development. I'm like, thank you, Lord. <laughs> this is my, this is one of my guys, you yeah. know? And I mean, obviously, over the next few years, you come on full-time staff and, um, you know, we, <laughs> I never forget you, you meet your wife at our house. <laughs> and I don't know if that was the Lord's divine <laughs> handling or Denise's. It was divine and Denise combo. Yeah, it was. It was probably like God to Denise. <laughs> and then Denise is like, well, I'm going to take action yeah, on I'm this. I'm going to go ahead and do this. And yeah. Of course, you meet Jerrica and, you know, three babies later, um, it's, you know, man, Sunday nights, we used to have the staff over. I say this all the time. One of my favorite memories is feeding Judah, who's now eight. Eight. Feeding Judah, burping him on Sunday nights uh, with Journey and Royce. I mean, they're just, uh, I just love them to death. And all of that, seeing you lead your family. How long have you been married now? Uh, we just celebrated nine years. Nine in years. Ugh. It's just amazing. And then. 
just recently we named you as associate lead pastor, which um, I'm just so honored that mm -hmm. you would accept that. And and it's really cool. Like we've been operating this way for a while. Mm -hmm. Yourself, Denise, and I, kind of as almost the co-visionary leaders of this particular uh, expression of the the local church. And I just feel like your leadership, how you um, carry yourself, your humility, your consistency, your loyalty. Um, I, if something would happen to me, you know, get hit by a bus, whatever, God brings me home early. I can look at you and just say, I know this church would continue to thrive wow. under your leadership. Wow. And um, mm. if, you know, I, I truly believe that. And so it really gives me a lot of peace. And as we lead this thing together, I'm excited. I, <laughs> I wanted to end, I, I know I want to talk to you like for three hours, for but sure, I, yeah. for our listeners, I wanted to end with this, Mike. And I know this is a, a tough question because you can't see what God wants to do, but if the Lord tarries yep. and he gives you another four decades on this planet, what would you love to see God do through the rest of your time here on this planet, like in and through your life? It's so good, man. It's, and I know that's a tough question, but it is. I, I'd love to just hear, and I'm sure the listeners would hear, there's a lot of people from our local church that are, will be listening to this. And I, I just want them to get an insight into your heart and what God's doing in and through you. Absolutely. Well, the first thing I'll say is, um, and, I, and I think it was Mark Batterson who said this first, but he said this, I want to be respected the most by those who know me the best. Oh, so good. And when I think about so 40 good, years from now and I think about mm -hmm. legacy, mm -hmm. when I think about even just the moment where maybe by God's grace, I'm on my deathbed, I want to be surrounded by those who knew me the most mm -hmm. and be able to look at all of them in the eyes and be able to, you know, thank them and and really, I hope that my life would speak to them as one of a man that was faithful, you know, that yeah. was there and consistent. And uh, so that's first and foremost, man, I, I, mm -hmm. I man, I want to be a guy that leaves a legacy through my family. If I could live another 40 years, man, I want to make many memories with, mm -hmm. with uh, my incredible family and those uh, that I'm really close to. I think the second thing is this, is I want my life to be marked as somebody that, that, uh, you know, contributed to the local church. Mm. I believe that, you know, there's one thing that Jesus said that he was building and it's his church. It's so good. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Mm. It's the one thing that he is building. And I, I want my life to be marked as somebody that, you know, sacrificed and gave and poured out uh, for the local church so that God could be glorified, man. So and um, I think the third thing that comes to mind for me is I, I really do, like God's given me this woe and this burden for leaders, like yeah, I just, I just, I see that. Uh, whether it's raising up leaders, coming alongside leaders, you know, speaking life into leaders, just seeing people walk in their full potential, but not just about like what they achieve, but how they achieve what they achieve. Real good. I want to see leaders. I want to see a generation of leaders who are whole and healthy mm. as a result of the little bit of deposit that I could potentially so make in their life. And so, mm. um, I see those three things all under the umbrella of man, just honoring God and being faithful to him. I mean, mm. he's, he, I always say this, man, my, my best days without God don't compare to my worst days with him. I'm so true. And I just, I want to, I want to hear those words. Well done, my good and faithful servant. It's funny, Mike, cause I, <clears throat> I see a picture of you in this house that God has blessed your family with. I see you <clears throat> at the, the kitchen table with your Bible open. And I just see your kids waking up in the morning and seeing you. And I think like, we overcomplicate this sometimes. Like, how am I gonna do that? How am I gonna be, totally. you know, 40 yeah. years from now with my family around me? And, and I think we overcomplicate it, but I see the picture of consistency with you and in, in Jesus at your kitchen table, a cup of good Joe. I, <laughs> yeah. I see Always, you with that, right? that good Joe and just you and the Lord in that secret place, man, on your face at times at that kitchen table. And I see God empowering you and leading you and, and flowing through you. 
for the next several years. I really see that. So and I just don't want, ever forget the simplicity of that. Yeah, and I want to just thank you for your for your investment, man. Yeah. Like I, <laughs> I, nothing cool. Like it's just you're like God through you. It's like you've given me a picture, you know, of, of what this looks like. I, I think of like the words that Paul said. He said to his followers, he's like, "Follow me as I follow Christ." Yeah, that's good. And and it's like that legacy continues on. It's like you're saying, "OC, oh, follow me as I follow Christ." And then those that are coming behind me, it's like, "Follow me as I follow Christ." And so, just mm-hmm. man, thank you for for showing me. It's, there's so many things I could say about your leadership and what you've deposited in me, and there's just no way that I would have developed or would even have the opportunities that I do today without you. So love you, man. Love you, buddy. Let me pray for you. Lord, thanks. So good to be able to hang with with Mike and just thinking about him and Jerrica and the children and maybe even future children, if that's mm-hmm. what you have in the cards. Just pray nothing but your best for them and the simplicity of loving you supremely. The entire O'Connell family loving you supremely with all their heart fully in, surrendered, in connection with you in this beautiful intimacy. And we know as a result, as they go vertical, that you'll flow through every one of them. And I pray just for power to be released through them, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control, the fruit of the Spirit would flow. Many leaders would be developed, invested in, cared for, and even in the tough seasons and and the loss and the pain and the pressure, I pray they'd stay steady in the pocket as a result of their connection with you every single day. We love you, God. Bless this family and all those that you'll bless through them. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Love you, buddy. That was fun. Yeah.